Good morning, and welcome, home worshipers, to this trendy Sunday service. Let us Christians give our thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and give our praise to our Creator, for God is good all, all the time. time. And all the time. God is good. Let us pray. Father God, we offer our thanks for your presence with us this day. Instill in us the desire to never, never forget that by your love that has made us and by your love that has kept us, we humbly ask that you forgive us for what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and guide us to be what you have called each of us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Today's scripture comes from the New Testament book of John in chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. I ask that you listen as I read from John's gospel. Jesus is speaking. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, Ken Gibble tells of spending his after-school hours as a child in the feed mill where his father worked. He enjoyed playing where the bags of feed were stacked high in rows. I loved playing games of pretend, he said. I imagined the feed bags being boulders to hide behind. Sometimes workers would come into the warehouse where Ken was playing. He would delight in spying on them without being seen. I was an Indian waiting in ambush, he recalls. I was the sheriff waiting to spring out and arrest some of those outlaws. This young boy spent many imaginative afternoons in the feed mill, waiting for his father to finish work for the day. As he got older, Ken began to realize that this pretend game of hiding in the feed mill represented his understanding of God. His thinking went like this. God is the one who stays hidden, spying on children, watching them from a safe distance. You had to be at best a little bit afraid of this God, Ken says, because you could never get away from him. God could look inside your head and read your every thought. Through the years, many parents, and I'll add at least one grandmother which I knew, had used this same tactic. God is watching you. God sees when you do something wrong. A popular song from a couple of years ago by Bette Midler declares, God is watching us from a distance. As an adult, Ken now says it's comforting to realize that God is watching, but is watching over us. Sometimes, though, I think many folks like keeping God at a distance instead of being an active influence in their lives. Well, today is the United Methodist Church's Trinity Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With those words, folks, we Christians baptize our children, we bury our spouses, we bury our dead, and we celebrate our sacraments. These words are part of the worship and ritual of every Christian body on this earth. Everywhere you go in the world, you will find Christians using the same language about God. A question for you. Just what do these words mean? Are they merely some theological mumbo-jumbo designed to confuse, or do they point to something real and something important? In saying the Apostles' Creed, as we did this morning, we made a statement of our faith in God, in Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. In discussing our Christian faith in God, we must go further than merely stating that we believe in God. I say that because just saying that sometimes can mean nothing. According to a recent Gallup poll, 92% of Americans believe in God. But for many, that belief is a vague notion about someone in the great somewhere, to quote the lyric from a song, I Believe, by Frankie Lane. For many people, the concept of God is nothing more than just a thought. C.S. Lewis, someone I've spoken about often from this pulpit, C.S. Lewis wrote about a girl he knew 
who said that the word God, the word God reminded her of a giant bowl of tapioca pudding. The only problem was that she hated tapioca pudding. Today, when religious fanatics threaten our world, we need to realize, folks, that believing in God is just not enough. We need to decide what kind of God we believe in. Do we believe in a God who approves of the oppression of millions of people by others? Do we believe in a God who approves of the murder, the murder of innocent people? And do we believe in a God who approves of the evil in the hearts of many of his creations? As Christians, we need to believe in a God who has revealed his nature and his purpose in and through Jesus Christ. We need to believe that God continues to reveal himself in and through today's disciples. That's each and every one of you out there at home. When Jesus was no longer with his disciples, they didn't believe that God had left them. Oh no. At Pentecost, the presence of God became richer and deeper in their lives as the Holy Spirit came upon them. Very early in the life of the Christian church, it was found necessary to speak of God in three ways. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Around the year 55 AD, Paul wrote two letters to the church at Corinth. In his second letter, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, Paul wrote this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I think St. Paul would have been surprised if someone had told him that those words would become an official blessing as well as a benediction used universally by the Christian church for the next 2,000 plus years. But those words sum up the essence of the Christian faith. We believe that because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have come to know the love of our God in and through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. As so we sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, persons, blessed Trinity. Does this mean that we believe in three gods? Certainly not. In fact, the doctrine of Trinity was set forth in an effort to preserve the oneness, the oneness of God. It was not developed by theologians living in some ivory tower. It came about through the day-by-day -day experience of those first Christians. As Jews, they believed in God, but they also experienced the presence of God visiting them in person, in the person of Jesus Christ, who they called the Christ, God's anointed one, the revealer of God, a prophet. And when Jesus was no longer with them in the flesh, they didn't feel that God had left them as well. Indeed, indeed, Jesus told them, it is to your advantage that I go away, for I will send the counselor to you, the Holy Spirit. I have been with you. He shall be with you. That's John 14, 16. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the supreme, the supreme revelation of God. And that place where he was at that one time was Palestine, a little country some 50 by 150 miles, somewhat smaller than the state of Massachusetts. But Christians believe the Holy Spirit universalized Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is more alive to millions millions of more people today than he ever was in that first decade, in that first century. Of course, the Trinity is a mystery to many. Theologians have spent lifetimes straining their brains, trying to completely understand it. Once understood, then they have to explain it. They have even tried to look into the inner workings of God's mind and describe the relationship in heaven between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is sort of like trying to psychoanalyze God. Good luck with that. I don't think that the doctrine of the Trinity is an attempt to describe what God is exactly. Rather, I believe that it is an attempt by Christians to describe the way in which God manifests himself to us here on earth. As a creator, the Father, as a redeemer, the Son, and as a sustainer, the Holy Spirit. It helps to remember that that to what the early church meant when it spoke of God in three persons. The word person comes from the Latin word persona and originally referred to the mask worn on the stage by actors in a play. Because of the mask, one actor in the Roman theater could play several 
different roles. So God plays different roles. Three roles, to be exact, on the stage of human history. You might say that the doctrine of the Trinity describes God's progressive efforts to get closer and closer and closer to each and every one of us. Let me explain what I mean by this using three prepositions. God wasn't content to be above, above us. So he came as the Son to walk among, among us. God wasn't content to walk among us. So he came as the Holy Spirit to dwell within, within us. That's what we mean when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as Yale Professor Alfred Lubbock said, it's God, is God, is God in the present tense. So the question lingers now, is what does the Holy Spirit do? That's the real question that makes the Trinity Doctrine relevant to your life and to my life this day. The Holy Spirit makes God real, folks, in our lives, in our lives. Our Pew Bible says that Jesus titles the Holy Spirit as a counselor. That is a translation of the Greek word parakatos, parakatos, hard to pronounce. A person in ancient courts of justice, a legal assistant, a counsel for the defense, an advocate, one who pleads the cause of another. The word is also defined as one who runs alongside a faltering soldier and cheers him or her on. We could all use a bit of cheering from time to time in our lives, could we not? That's what the Holy Spirit is for us. In the old King James Version, the Holy Spirit was called the Comforter. I repeat, the Comforter. There's a story of a seminary student in Edinburgh, Scotland, who made a typographical error on a term paper. The student was trying to say that the Lord has taken away our guilt, but instead he typed, the Lord has taken away our quilt. To which the student's professor wrote in the margin, that's all right, the Lord promised to send us a comforter anyway. Not a bad word, for it comes from a Latin meaning one who stands beside to give us strength. I don't think any of us would argue that we all could use an extra portion of spiritual strength from time to time in our lives. A bit of Methodist history now for each and every one of you. One of the nicknames given to the early Methodists was the Enthusiast. The enthusiasts. Enthusiasts are people who have a keen interest in a particular activity or a particular thing. But in the early days, Methodists weren't viewed like that. They were looked upon as being kind of weirdos. Imagine people who sought to live their lives completely under the direction of the Holy Spirit. But the word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words, in theos, meaning in God. What would our lives look like if we lived in theos? If we lived in God, I dare say there would be more joy and power to them, each of us in this world. The church is supposed to be the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Someone once suggested that around any given church, there might be drawn three circles. An outer circle, a middle circle, and an inner circle. The outer circle are those to whom religion is little more than just a routine. It's more of a burden than a blessing. Pastor Harry Fawzik once said, some people have just enough religion to make themselves miserable. These folks attend church occasionally, drop a few dollars in the offering plate, call on the church for a wedding or for a funeral or maybe a baptism. Tragically, this group is quite large, quite large. In, in the middle circle are those who have some sort of religious experience somewhere along the line that's had some influence on them. They attend church fairly regularly, contribute fairly well, but their religion has little power, little power in it. They go through the motions, but sometimes missing. But they don't know what they're missing or what they need to do to find what it is they're missing. Again, this group tends to be fairly large. But then there's that third group, the inner circle. These are the people, and every congregation is blessed, I say blessed to have them, for whom religion is a reality. It's not a ritual. They know what it is to have a personal, personal relationship with God the Father, with God the Son, and with God the Holy Spirit. Now that term inner circle sounds a bit snobbish. I'm a member of the inner circle. But you know what? God doesn't uh, choose those who are in that inner circle. Oh no. 
Nor does God erect walls to keep others out of that inner circle. God, through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, proclaimed a welcome to all to come on in, to come on into that inner circle. If anyone is outside this circle of God's love, it's because of their own choosing. Founder of the Methodist movement in the 1700s was, as you know, John Wesley. Wesley firmly believed that it was the Holy Spirit that raised Methodist up to proclaim God's work through his son, Jesus Christ. It was the Trinity, folks, the Trinity at work. Amen?